Okay. All right, so welcome everybody to yet another installment of Open Game Data Open Office Hours. And I'll just do a brief introduction and then we'll hand it off to who our presenters are this week. Um, so the Open Game Data community is, um, we are an NSF-funded research incubator, bringing together a collective of researchers who are interested in data generated in and around games to advance our scientific understanding of thinking, learning, and decision-making. Um, and so we have two primary goals as part of this project. One of them is to compile a collection of resources and best practices on how to use data in and around games to better understand different sorts of human psychological phenomena and sort of advance the field of methods there. And then the second one is eventually to build real infrastructure um, and sort of shareable best practices and technology so that the field can do this kind of work together better. Um, we have a lot of resources already. So um, this Open Game Data website uh, is hosted by David Gagnon's team and, and shows some examples of kind of a vision of where we'd like to go with this sort of work. And we're looking to add more and more games to that collection. We also have a Slack um, where we uh, talk and chat and sort of set up these office hour sessions as well as share resources. Um, and then these open office hour sessions themselves um, are a place for people to provide examples of work in progress how they did things, what they're thinking about, um, and get feedback and ideas. Um, so for how these sessions are gonna work, uh, they're kind of based on a model of this set of series of sessions that the Statistical Education Research Group at CMU used to do, where a person could present, usually a student or a postdoc, on some project they were working with, and then one of the stats faculty would sit there and just publicly workshop with them as if they were sitting in office hours of like, did you consider this? Or what about this other idea? Or where could you go with that? Um, and it was super valuable to sit in the audience of that and just get so much knowledge about how professionals think about this space. Um, and so what we're gonna do is hand off some time to the presenters, they'll talk about a project um, and then uh, open up the floor for the community to sort of bring up ideas or ask questions and clarifications. Um, the sessions are recorded pending presenter approval. So Jose, are you good with recording? Yes. Great. Um, and they'll be shared to the community afterwards. Um, Manuel maybe he can give consent as well because he will be. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. No problem. <laughs> Great. No, definitely not. Yeah. Um, and so some things to keep in mind, presenters are often going to be showing work that's in progress. So things might not be totally done. There might be some things that might look like mistakes or things they might not have considered yet. And that's totally fine and expected. Um, our goal is to help them make progress on their project and move things forward. Um, to accomplish their goals and that these sessions are for, about learning for everybody involved so if you don't understand something that somebody brought up have a question you want to ask as a clarification feel free to just raise your hand you can use the in hand the in zoom thing and i'll and i'll sort of moderate um if you want to follow up and with that i will hand it off to jose and manuel uh, once i find my stop sharing button there we go Should I share Manuel or? Yeah. Okay. Can you see the presentation, Jose? Yes. Okay. So do you want to start? Okay, yes, I will start. Uh, so we will present you, uh, I will, we will introduce ourselves in a second, but uh, we will yep. talk first about uh, one of the core uh, PhD thesis goals of Manuel, which has been on interoperable game-based assessment. Uh, that has been one of his focuses. And, uh, and, that, uh, and then afterwards, I have a couple of slides, I think two or three slides about, about another pro other projects that we perform in the context of game-based assessment and also more generally speaking, serious games. Uh, to share some ideas, and maybe you can also share ideas, and maybe you or maybe you would be interested in collaboration along these lines. Next, yeah. okay. So my name is Manuel Gomez. I am a third year uh, PhD student at the University of Murcia. Uh, I am a computer science engineer, and I also completed my master's degree in big data technologies. Uh, and although my PhD is focused on the game business assessment area, I have also uh, worked with distributed systems, with natural language processing, and generally data analysis in different educational contexts. 
And in my case, uh, I'm an associate professor at the University of Murcia. I have uh, diverse experience in different universities. I did my PhD in, in Madrid at the University of Carlos III of Madrid. Then I did a, a postdoc at MIT. I came back uh, here to Spain. I was also an associate professor at the Complutense University of Madrid, at the University of Edinburgh. I stay. I've moved across different com uh, companies and universities. Um, I currently teach mostly about computer science and artificial intelligence. And in terms of research, one of the focuses is game-based assessment. Uh, we're also working on other parts of serious games, like uh, we're starting, for example, work on uh, serious games for artificial intelligence teaching and other topics. More generally speaking about uh, learning analytics, um, in some cases, multimodal learning analytics, for example, in the context of serious games as well. Uh, we're also working on cyber ranges for cybersecurity training, which are virtualized infrastructures for cybersecurity training and also disinformation. And all of this is in the context of a lab, a big lab here at the University of Murcia, which we call the Cyber Data Lab, uh, that we have started some years ago and is growing importantly in the last years. Uh, and the topic today, if we go to the next slide, will be as mentioned on game-based assessment as a service. That's the whole idea. Uh, we did, uh, I think this was the first uh, literature review on the topic of game-based assessment that was published in IEEE Transaction and Learning Technologies. Uh, here we have insights regarding uh, the current status of game-based assessment. Uh, for us, one of the main insights was that, that the, the not, maybe not the major, but one of the biggest uh, problems in the area was that everything is performed ad hoc based on the game based assessment environment. So you have your game, you design your game from scratch, you start collecting data, and then you build an assessment machinery uh, fully ad hoc to your game. And of course, you, you, if you have a new game or a new environment, you need to repeat the same process all over again, which results in an incredible investment of time. And of course, that doesn't scale if you want to build an infrastructure and so on. Um, so in this uh, context, we wanted to explore what options we have for uh, interoperability. And in this case, the, the open data project that uh, David started at that point, I, I remember I met David some years ago, and she mentioned the, he mentioned this open data data set, was a perfect environment to collect data from different sources, uh, different games. Uh, and then to uh, explore the, the possibilities to have interoperable game-based assessments. So in this case, uh, we focus on a direction that has been used uh, widely in other domains, which is uh, the use of ontologies to provide a, a, a middleware or a middle point uh, to uh, uh, integrate knowledge in and re knowledge representation. Uh, and we, on, we didn't only want to have this idea of the ontology to provide this representation layer, but we also wanted to uh, analyze how this could work from a, from a uh, service perspective. So we deployed the environment thinking about, about the idea of game-based assessment as a service. We've seen this as a service paradigm in many domains. Uh, and, and we wanted to uh, analyze the viability of doing the same in the context of game-based assessment. So we developed a full API and a specific infrastructure to do so. And the last step was to validate this framework that we develop, uh, particularly with games and open data from the field day. And that is what Manuel will tell you up in more details. Feel free to also to stop us if you wanna mention something or discuss something. There are multiple technological uh, areas or multiple technologies. So if you want a clarification in anything, feel free to stop Manuel and he can explain. Okay, so basically, if you're not familiar with ontologies, ontologies provides us with an alternative way to represent elements, concepts, and relationships within a certain knowledge domain. So uh, they are in some way similar to classic UML uh, class diagrams that we already know, but uh, ontologies are specifically designed to facilitate data integration uh, to unify different data sources by providing a common semantic framework. Uh, this could be a very basic example of an ontology in a movie domain. So we will have a thing, which would be like the parent class. Then we have the movie concept, a person and a script. Then we have thriller and drama, which are the types of movie, actor and director, which are persons. And then the relationship between the different movies and the different uh, actor, director and scripts. 
So just a, a very basic example of what an ontology is. Uh, this is the methodology that we followed uh, to build our game-based assessment ontology. We have three big uh, stages. In the first stage, uh, we collected all the literature uh, and analyzed it. And then we, once we have all the literature analyzed, we go into the development stage in which we implement uh, and conceptualize all the information. And then this is an iterative process uh, in which we checked if the ontology met our objectives or not. Uh, and once the ontology uh, met our original objectives, then we can go into the post-development stage. This is the core concept dictionary that we built uh, from all the different uh, sources of knowledge. We see important concepts in the game business assessment area and possible synonyms such as game, game event, game achievement, uh, unit of play, which is uh, the, a synonym for level, attempt, game session, and so on. And then we also uh, specified a binary relation table, specifying the relationships between each pair of, co of concepts. So for example, we see uh, the relationship between a game session that has one or more attempts and the attempt which is from one uh, and only one game session. This is the graphical representation of, of our complete ontology. You can see many different uh, concepts and all the different relationships. You can check also all the details in, in this paper, which was published a, a, week, a week or two weeks ago. You can see, for example, the concept of user, which is part of a user group, a user which plays attempts, then this attempt is playing on a certain level, which is played on a certain scenario. Also, this level is from certain game and so on. Okay, so all the concepts and all the relationships uh, identified in the literature. So once uh, we had our ontology developed, uh, our objective was to build a framework uh, to support interoperable metrics uh, using the ontology. So we wanted to unify all these different data sources, all these different log event files from different games into a common semantic uh, knowledge model, which is our ontology. We established a set of uh, five different requirements. The first requirement, which is the semantic layer, is already accomplished by our developed ontology. Then we also wanted uh, our framework to be able to process large-scale data. We also want to perform interoperable assessments. We want to uh, calculate different metrics between different uh, games. Then we also want to establish an easy communication with external data sources, integrating a service API and also enabling users to interact with the uh, with our framework as a transparent service and enabling the this part of uh, as a service of our research. And then finally, we also wanted to ensure privacy, authentication, and authorization with different uh, users, different roles different permissions and ensuring that each user has access only to the to the appropriate data. This is the complete framework uh, architecture that we developed. We have different uh, modules. The first module is the preprocessing module right here. In this first stage, we transform all the original game data from the log event files uh, using Python. Uh, we transform it to ontology-based data, which are RDF or XML files. And then this uh, result is used by the analytics inference and query module. Here we use Spark, which is a big data uh, processing engine. And then we also use an inference module to uh, in which we can define uh, rules, custom rules, to infer even more information that we originally had. And then once we have all the information, we use the query system to implement our metrics. Our metrics can be stored in different formats using databases or different uh, data format files. And then we have the service API uh, in which clients can interact uh, with it either to query the metric results or to deposit data and then be analyzed and proce processed and so on. 
So to validate our framework, uh, first we wanted to replicate some literature metrics, uh, which are usually very basic, such as the number of events, the number of completed levels, uh, total time spent, and different completion times. And then we also designed some more complex metrics, such as persistence or uh, play styles in which we used uh, machine learning and, and specifically a clustering based approach uh, that group players uh, based on different sub features. Uh, we also ran some uh, experiments. Uh, for these uh, concrete ex experiments, we use five different games from the Open Game Data Repository. Crystal balloon, cycle carbon, magnet, and waves. With these uh, data set sizes, uh, I think uh, if I remember well, that each uh, data set or each file was from an um, entire month, data from an entire month, but uh, in some cases, from some games, uh, they are from more than one month. So, so they are uh, big uh, data set sizes. So we run our experiments in a cluster of six nodes with one master node and five worker nodes. We run uh, our experiments increasing first the number of workers and also the, the, the data set size uh, gradually. And then we see that the optimal configuration uh, is from the four worker node configuration. We get almost the same result as using five worker nodes. Uh, but saving uh, these resources. And uh, the key point here is that we are able to compute 2 million events, which is a very big uh, amount of events. Uh, yeah, also computing six different metrics in about 32 or 33 minutes, which is a very good uh, result comparing it to, to, to classic data science approaches that we were previously using. So we also built two different use cases of, to illustrate how this framework could be used in real scenarios. The first use case is a, an interoperable dashboard in which you have uh, you can log in with your credentials and then you have here a sidebar with different options. You can, for example, upload uh, your own data. I have here different gaming data files from, from the Open Game Data Repository from different games also different data format options. And then once you have uploaded your file, you can see here the preview and then all the processing starts on the background. Then once uh, all the metrics have been computed, you can select uh, in, the, in the sidebar any of the metric tabs. You have selection boxes for all the different games. So you can check any game that you have or that that user has access to. You also can select different groups, different users. You can see here, uh, for example, levels of activity metric, which shows uh, very basic statistics about each user. And then you have here uh, more, example about, more examples about more metrics. Here, for example, the levels of difficulty metric showing uh, a general difficulty measure computed for each level in the game played based on different sub features. And yeah, and then some more examples. And then the second use case, the second use case would be a, a student report. I think I have it here, the complete report. Yeah. So this report uh, is also generated automatically in, uh, by the by the framework. So you can see here this report has been generated for instructor with username, blah, blah, blah. And you have information from these groups and from these games. So you have here some information, general information about uh, the group with different statistics. Also here some levels that could be problematic based on the abandoned percentage. Here's some uh, more visualizations and then a more a specific report about about each student uh, individually with more statistics and then some more visualizations with different metrics. Uh, okay, uh, Jose, uh, should we, I we stop can, sharing? Yes, we can stop here. Okay. We yeah. to see if we have more questions about uh, this uh, topic. And then we can mention other uh, other projects okay. that we have conducted. Yeah. 
So if anybody has questions, feel free to raise a hand or something. Um, I can ask one in the interim. Um, on your ontology graph, I was kind of curious to see how it didn't seem like there was a link between like user and learning outcome. Like it was medi it was mediated by attempt. <laughs> so users can't have learning outcomes, I guess. Uh, at least that's what it seemed like to me. Maybe I'm misreading this ontology graph, but uh, is that correct? A correct read of the graph, whether or not it's a correct read of the ontology. <laughs> so the, the, you mean that the user can have learning outcomes yeah like in in some ex to some extent like the a goal of a lot of learning analytics or educational technology systems would would be to, for users yes. to have outcomes and so it's kind of curious to me that there is no direct connection between a user so, and a learning outcome so there is a sort of a hierarchy so that means that if a use is an attempt is associated to a user and an yeah. learning outcome is associated to an attempt all those learning outcomes are also associated to that uh, user okay uh, <laughs> Good point. And then similar with play style. Uh, um, yeah, similarly. It's not like a direct link, but, mm -hmm. but yeah. So attempt here is kind of the the almost like sort of the root or like the the highest network centrality, if you think about it that way. Um, yeah. Like most things are mediated by attempts. Yeah. Uh, Wow. So this work is so exciting to me. <laughs> so I'll start there. It is so exciting. So the fact that you were able to calculate metrics, or we, I think we've had this, we call them features usually, but across all these games and that you have one set that makes sense, that unlocks the ability for us to come up with common visualizations and to continue growing this set of ontological, you know, words. So the the overall idea is just so exciting to me. Um, I have a couple questions that come to mind, I guess, right? So I can't imagine that the work would ever be done. So it seems like this graph is a living graph. It's like every new game that you try to fold in you know, some of them will fit immediately and naturally, and then some of them will make you think about things slightly differently. And I'm curious, <laughs> and I know you've already done this much work, but can you imagine how the meta process about this process, which would be how does this work live over time? Do you have thoughts on that yet? So I can uh, try to answer that, Manuel. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so basically, this ontol—the idea of ontologies is that they are completely uh, living entities uh, that they can get adjusted to new knowledge, uh, because the the objective is to represent knowledge. So if you receive new knowledge, that means that you can adjust the ontology. Uh, I'm not sure if the, the the methodology that we followed, if you go to the previous uh, the initial page of the it was methodology, met right? It was this. this yeah. Methodology was called. Yeah, it, it was a, an adaptation, but yeah. Yes, uh, I'm not sure if there was a, a specific uh, part of uh, maintenance in the last in the last part that would explain how this maintenance is performed. But this is definitely yeah. a living entity. So if you if we have new knowledge because a game is not appropriately fitting this ontology, uh, we would be able to uh, readapt the ontology to uh, fit the new knowledge. Definitely. Yeah, and also we don't have a, a process yet to, to do so. Yeah, and ontologies are very flexible in that in that sense, so. Yeah. I can say one of the places that we've struggled the most has been around the thing that you're calling scenario and unit of play and attempt. And it, it, it's like most of the things I think we we've done you know maybe twenty games so far, and I think all of them have they've pretty much all made sense except for two, and I'm curious how you think about these. One of them was Wake, has the problem that the 
there's a, a there's a quest or a job or a level that makes sense. It has a beginning and then you do things and it has an end, but it ha also has the idea of a task, which you can only know if they were doing a task once it had been complete because there wasn't a sequence to the task and they never start the task. So every job says, go figure this out. Here are some of the things you might wanna do and the what you might want to do are getting checked off once certain requirements are are completed within the game system. But it, you have to, whenever we do analysis, the task is always retrospective. We have to say, well, they completed the task, so what were the things they did before it? So that was one problematic structure. And then the second one was in Lakeland where it, there wasn't a level progression there only was achievements. So it's similar in that you're playing in this world and then every once in a while we pop up a, a prompt that says, oh, you completed a thing we, we cared about, but we didn't tell you we cared about it and you never told us you wanted to try to do that. It just happened. So I'm curious if you have thought at all or if, because that seems really central, to like what is someone doing and what is the unit of analysis? I was curious if you thought at all about those retrospective units of analysis and if they're compatible with this. Yeah, uh, you have to more or less in, in each game interpret what is a unit of play or what is an attempt. So uh, I remember using a game uh, data from Lakeland and what I, if I remember well, I think I treated each uh, game session as an entire attempt. So we did not have like unit of plays, just okay. only one. Yeah. Only one unit of play, one attempt, and then everything goes inside inside there. So it depends on the game. But Tiffany, there, there would be room for improvement. If we yeah. take a, many more games and we not we talk with the game designers, they could interpret this better because we just had the some time for Manuel to play the games and try to fit the the, yeah, the mechanics do, into this ontology. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And just a follow up question, and then Jesse's hand is up. Just still. <laughs> um, is, is there affordance for like you were saying that maybe someone would want to reinterpret or have a different interpretation of what a unit of play meant in Lakeland? Is it possible to have those kinds of like for a specific game have a branch and potential interpretation of? unit of play or would the ontology need to afford like multiple interpretations of unit of play in some way, if that makes sense. Oh. Parallel ontology, is it a thing? Yeah. <laughs> or ontology through interpretive frame or whatever. I don't know. I, I think that it would be probably uh, flexible because it's uh, depending on the, the the interpretation that you do, then you will see the metrics adapted to that inter interpretation. One thing is that the that the interpretation doesn't fit into the ontology, which would need to uh, require a redesign, a change in the ontology. Another thing is that you interpret differently how a game would fit the ontology. Uh, but if the game can fit the ontology, then you only need to be um, uh, wary of the metrics because then the interpretation might be different. Yeah, I think that relates to where my head was going. Um, so for some background, I um, am at PBS Kids and we have over 200 some games and only some of them are outfitted with um, sort of detailed log data, essentially. But we think that there's a lot of potential for developing that for our other games. But there's hundreds of them. Um, and so like this idea of this standard framework is really exciting. Um, and I'm wondering how, um, how different types of games fit into this. So something that we talk about with um, our games is that sometimes there's a very clear goal, like we want the kid to go through this process and select the right answer. Um, other times there's this goal of, you know, just exploring a concept. Um, and we think that 
we can still learn something from the way that kids are exploring concepts, but it's really hard to interpret like what they're doing essentially until after they've done it, but we've also not directed them what to do. So how do we do that? So like, are there, do you think that there are different types of games and are there different types of games that are better suited for this ontology? And is it a matter of you need to have more examples to grow the ontology to fit um, these potential other games? I feel like that was so, a big question and they've probably touched <laughs> on a little bit of it already. <laughs> Thank you, Jesse. Uh, so I would say that one thing that maybe we didn't uh, emphasize a lot is that this game, this ontology was designed uh, thinking about the serious games for game-based assessment. And if mm -hmm. we go for traditional game-based assessment, we think about the traditional maybe ECD design with evidence-centered design, which we have a task model and uh, the task, the, the student will do the exercise and generate the evidence and so on. If we that, go to that traditional design, then we will probably have those units of play. We will have attempts. We have clear evidence that we can collect regarding that uh, constraints mm -hmm. that we want to measure. If we go maybe to more uh, other types of serious games that are more maybe inquiry-based learning, or uh, maybe that there is not such a task model in those games, which in those cases, I think it will be harder to fit uh, those games into the ontology than if we go to the traditional game-based assessment uh, environment where they have a clear task, task model and attempts for each one of the tasks. Mm -hmm. What do you think? Yeah, I think, yeah, <laughs> I, think that may, I think that makes sense, right? Like, and that's something that we struggle with sometimes too when we're trying to outfit these games and understand how we can use them is like, well, what is the goal of this game? Um, and is there something that we can actually directly assess or feel confident that we can infer something about what kids are learning or doing or what their skill levels are um, based off of the way the game is set up. Um, because uh, so at CBS Kids, our goal is to teach kids something with the games. It's not necessarily to assess, right? Or, um, and, and the play and entertainment is still um, front and center in our designs. So, there's a lot of choices that we're kind of, as researchers, trying to say, you know, what these games can tell us about kids. There's there's a lot of things that we're kind of working with after the fact, after the game developers have made the game, right? Um, and so I'm just trying to think through like how all of this can work and thinking through um, also the, some of the different um, learning goals that our games have. So for example, we had a, a computational thinking game set um, that's coming out now and it is well-designed of like, there's it's clear what the goal of the game is, but one of the goals of the game is to get you to revise something. Um, so thinking through also like the goal is not to get the answer right. The goal is to understand how to change your design and what it means to, um, what it means to revise something. Um, and there's like that bit of encouraging you to explore different ways to do something. So it's again, um, just trying to think through like how, how our <laughs> scenarios might apply to this or like what different changes, um, so, like maybe it's a it, different ontology. I don't know. It, it, could be, it could be possible for the ontology to accommodate, mm -hmm. accommodate uh, uh, in the, the game uh, entity maybe accommodate the type of game and based on the type of game you could adjust what are the relationships and what uh, what are the the, the mm -hmm. other nodes so for example if you can think about big types of games puzzle game or exploratory game or that would mm -hmm. be also possible to have an ontology that could accommodate, accommodate all that and because mm -hmm. you can always keep uh, expanding your, your ontology then if you, mm -hmm. in the future you come with a new type of game, you can still uh, uh, add a new uh, change and adapt it. So that yeah, would be it's all super yeah. exciting. My brain's just like, wow, oh, where do I go with this? <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, I had a couple of questions that kind of sparked by that, that um, I think I'm, I'm kind of new to this ontological process stuff. So um, I'm curious if this is a thing. I remember Jose, when we were, co-editing that journal issue, like there were some discussions we were having about like, there's a difference between designing a game for assessment and designing a game for learning. And and we all agreed on that and we never went deeper as to like, but what is that difference? <laughs> um, and uh, I wonder if 
doing a similar approach, but with like game based learning games um, and like putting the two ontologies next to each other and seeing like this is in both of them, this is a difference that's not in both of them or whatever um, could actually be a way to start to like nail down that fuzzy discussion that we were always having about like what is the difference between a game for learning and a game for assessment that we all feel exists but don't have specific words to articulate and i wonder if it would be like if we just had a corpus of like presumably we could do this with pbs kids games because this doesn't necessarily need student data this just needs games i mean you need some data to validate that the ontology can interpret the data but like it's more it's more of a game interpretive well, we have process data. Mm -hmm. right but i know there's some potential shakiness around sharing <laughs> um but uh that could potentially be really interesting as a follow-up on on being able to try to articulate that difference. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. And one cool thing, Jesse, that you mentioned uh, before uh, about the uh, not that you are not open to share data. One cool thing about this framework that we also have with all the different models is that you could query the framework with, without actually having the data, and because we do have a common data format. If everything fits, you could qu you could query the all the games at the same time without actually accessing the 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 data itself. So it could be you know deposit over there, fit in the ontology, and you could query without actually. So it would be also private a privacy uh, preserving framework. Mm. Uh, and then I had a second ontological question or ontological forms question. Um, thinking more on the uh, sort of engineering and like developers as users side of things. Um, this ontology is based around can we get to game based assessment from data? Um, I would be curious to see if you could come up with a similar sort of ontology on the side of like how do developers think about how games are built? Because um, this probably doesn't directly relate necessarily to like how I would build this in Unity. Um, and if it were possible to do those two things, could you start to make this ontology just come out of Unity or Unreal or whatever, like built into the tool without having to instrument? Um, if if there was a way to make this mapping between like how does how does a particular play actor ever get implemented, it would automatically log to the ontological format rather than having to be something that have to be instrumented. Yeah, I think that if we talk with the game, with several game designers and they we uh, give this ontology, they will make many changes based on what they understand for in terms of game design. This would be very interesting to see the point of view of game designers in building an ontology for what defines a game. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then I can stop talking for it, Dave. Go ahead. <laughs> uh, that's good. Um, the, I'll respond to that one because I, I feel like I, I have some questions and some thoughts about that. So one way that I know we've thought about it is that the game, the game is the game. Like certain things actually happen and certain things can be described. And when we think about the the kinds of events that a game can send, I think about that in a pure way, that there is some objective reality to what happened, what choices were made, what was put on screen, how the system responded, and that I I feel like at the end of the day, you can say we have we have described it. It is done. And we never actually get to done, but we get really close very fast. So the game sends events. And the, the issue with that is that the game events are, um, they're always very specific to the game. And while there are certainly common ones, I feel like they have to, you have to describe a game in its own language. So here's a, the, that's my first observation. And that's why I would not be excited about having Unity log metrics or features because metrics and features are interpreted. There's a layer of logic that says, what do those things mean? And that will change all the time where what the player did won't change. Like that really happened at that moment in time and isn't really to be debated if the logging isn't working correctly. So my question in the middle of this and my thinking in the middle of this is, I would be really curious if we, let's say today we decided your ontology is version one, let's go, everybody's on board, let's make the whole field of game-based assessment follow this ontology. We could do that, say, let's go. And then I would be really curious how we would design the coupling 
between any game's unique vocabulary and the mapping to the ontology, and it, you've already done it. So I'd be curious about creating a specification there of like what the output has to be. <laughs> like, is there a way to formalize that coupling layer, that connection layer between the unique language of a game and the inputs required to calculate these ontological features? Because I think, I think it could be done, and I think that's a thin layer that any game could then provide and then just plug into this like very rapidly. That's my assumption, but you, you've done it. So I'm curious if you hold my assumption that a game event is pure, <laughs> that is uninterpreted. And I'm also curious if you hold the, the same opinion that the translation layer of a game event into something that could be processed by an ontological metric computation, if that layer is thin, if or if it actually requires a lot of logic. I'm not sure if I can answer that question, David. <laughs> Manuel, any idea? <laughs> no, the, the way that, that we solved it in, in this case is that we have like a, a common common category events. So you we ha we had to define for each game like the correspondence between the specific events. And then the common category that then it's going to be analyzed by the ontology. We ask a follow up. So then the analysis for the ontology has its own ontology <laughs> of the kinds of events it needs. To yes. Make yeah, so that I think that's where we could go with that would be if we version that, if we say version 1.0 of ontolo ontology input requires these events, and that will produce ontology version one metrics, then any game could become version one ontology compatible by simply providing their own translation into those input events. Right? Yes. Yeah, I want to build that. Yeah, I think that's what I was thinking of. Like, we we do still have to do a lot of like, well, what's the metric of interest from this game? And so in the case of the um, computational thinking game, like we're looking at how often are the kids revising um, their design and how efficient are those revisions, right? But that's like that. So I think that like event, we have that number, like outcome metric maps onto this ontology and will make sense. Um, but you still have to do that translation, right? To say that for this game, this is the thing that's interesting. Yeah. Um, and that's the piece that, you know, we that that's the piece that is hard to scale in our experience. Yeah. Um, because there's definitely things that apply to um, we call them game-based indicators, and we have sort of common game-based indicators like active time. Um, you know, how far they got in the game, that sort of thing. But then there's usually these um, game specific indicators, which are usually in my, well, in my opinion, they're more interesting. Um, <laughs> but, but that was my other question was going to be like, have you done um, the indicators and outputs and metrics that you, that you have made? Have you validated them to say like how they relate to X skill that this game is supposed to be assessing? So like how good are those shared outputs? Um, does active time, I believe active time was one of the outputs, does that um, correlate with their skill on whatever skill that game was supposed to be assessing? No, in, in this case, the, the validation was more technological than uh, mm -hmm. actually focus on learning. So we took metrics from the literature we reproduce those metrics in all those games to validate that it was working, and then we were able to mm -hmm. output them. But we didn't do a. The first problem that we have is that we don't do really understand completely well the context where this data was collected, and that's mm -hmm. part of what Bill they did. We don't understand the games closely; only a couple of them that we we were familiar with. So it's very hard for us to do uh, 
that effectively. For, for that kind of, kind of mm -hmm. case study, we would need to collaborate, for example, with David Lab, David's lab in order to for them to do the more uh, low level analysis to see if the metrics make sense and so on. Mm. I it's think more a technological validation. One thing that I think you're getting at, Jesse, that I think would be really helpful for the field would be to continue thinking about what level of analysis we're talking about. So at least mm -hmm. with open game data, we think raw events, and then we have features. And the features can be for sessions, players, populations, or technically any way you want to aggregate. And then on top of that, we have models that use those mm -hmm. features to say something. And then I feel like there is another layer of the analyses of those models. And that, so when you start saying, well, how good is the model? So you've got mm -hmm. a on top of that. So you can, and I'm, I'm more and more thinking that there is maybe my approach that I said isn't correct, but I think there might be a reasonable four or five abstraction layer system that we could all agree on. And if we did that, it would help us be more interoperable. Yes. Because this <laughs> thing would be on the four calculating features, this defines the input and the output of that one layer. So technically any system of models should be able to be built on top of it and any game system of events should be able to feed into it. Um, so I'm really curious about developing some like file standards that exist between those. So we don't even need APIs, but it's just, if you can be the, I mean, I'm gonna keep pushing open game data, but if you can be an open game data raw file, that means something. And if you can be an open game data metrics file, that means something. And um, I think it can be done. I'm very curious to take something like this and start experimenting with versioning around it so that we can start saying, if you provide these raw events, we can calculate all of these metrics and we can visualize all these metrics. Um, but we just have to give it a name. It's like the never ending story. Otherwise the world falls apart. <laughs> Huh. I'm so excited by this work. But literally to questions. just the vocabulary and getting everybody on the same page with vocabulary would be helpful. Like even within PBS Kids, our research and within the research team within PBS Kids, we have a hard time with vocabulary sometimes. And what do we mean by this? And what is that? Um, so like, I would just love, I don't, I don't care who sets it up I would love to have a common structure for vocabulary based off of something like this that you know makes sense for the game right um it it would just help all well, the communication there's <laughs> a proposal um why don't why don't the people on this call co-author a paper immediately that it <laughs> lays out a reasonable approach for the different levels of game data moving through a pipeline that we all agree on and say that was version one. <laughs> I love it. I'm sold. Sign me up. <laughs> Raw to analyses. Um, mm -hmm. And then we publish it somewhere where a bunch of other game analytics people hang out so we can get torn to shreds so we can make version 1.1. 1. 1. Yep. One <laughs> is next. It's inevitable. But if we could, if for example, if we knew that a that you had a system that was running that could process 20 million events in 30 minutes and all we have to do is make a file shaped a certain way for it to work we would be compelled to make sure that we make that file <laughs> um and i think that those kinds of motivation structures are what the field needs are like i was talking with um barbara chamberlain who's at new mexico state university and she, they make games that are played by 4 million kids a year or something. So they, big impact at that university, right? For a university studio. And I loved how clear she was where she just said, we only have, you know, so much money and so much time. And for us to want to collaborate, 
we just need to see where it saves us money and time because we're we care about these things and we that's our mission um and i just want to make it really easy for people to want to collaborate it's like what how do we get everybody to a benefit to collaborate and i i think some of those standards would do it especially if you've got a system that can process 30 20 million events in 30 minutes So, so I think that we are be beyond time to show you other studies. So we we might need to uh, yeah that was that's the question so that, yeah, sure. yeah. <laughs> other stuff in a in a different meeting some other day. Yeah, that's we got plenty of time slots. Uh, <laughs> um, starting in April. Uh, but yeah, so we are close to time. Just for anybody who's watching yeah. the talk, and I actually have a tighter next thing today than I normally do. Um, but just want to. Thank Jose and Manuel for sharing their work. Super, super interesting. Clearly inspired a lot of ideas. Um, and I think we should totally uh, follow up on some of these threads of relating this ontology to other kinds of games, finding finding other kinds of games that would be difficult to fit into it or different kinds of analyses that would be difficult to fit into it so we can figure out what, how it should actually be shaped um, and uh, and grow. was our, our pleasure. Yeah, thank you for sharing this. I'll I'll follow up on the paper idea. I'll I'll see if I can push that forward one idea or for one moment. I think the I think the trying to do it for game based learning instead of game based assessment and then comparing the two would be super interesting. Uh -huh. I agree. Uh -huh. That's a concept. Uh -huh. I feel like I have so many arguments with YJ about <laughs> but is it she would always ask but is this game for assessment yeah. I would say, oh it's not <laughs> I, I, I i know that well <laughs> that's what i make the emphasis on this was developed for game it's assessment <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. she's like it's not going to be a good assessment i'm like i don't care <laughs> <laughs> that's next that's another project <laughs> yeah that's great Okay, well, thank you all. Um, I will see you in a few weeks, if not sooner. Thank you. <laughs> and Bye -bye, guys. I think it's true for thank everybody you. here, but if you haven't joined the Slack, please do so and share ideas and maybe jump on this paper concept. Um, I'm also in the midst of making a better landing page for this event that's not a Google Doc. <laughs> um, <laughs> and hopefully it should be easier to share around. So both the recording and stuff will be up there and people can see it and, and all those other resources as well. So. Great. Thank you all. We'll see you in two weeks. Or you sign up for two weeks from now. Me. David? I'm presenting on the data that I'm going to collect in three minutes. <laughs> <laughs> People are showing yeah. up. <laughs> yeah. Talk about work in progress. Um, <laughs> see you. All right. Bye-bye. See you all. Bye.